So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus now next 15, 20 minutes on what we have been doing at AIT uh, and, and, and applying these technology in, is technologies in structural engineering. So this work has been done at the structural engineering program, which I'm part of, and also at AIT Solutions, which is uh, it's like a you know, research and consulting arm of the university. And this, this is the area that we have been working on, and I will give you some examples now. The first one is using AI instruction design process, which I mentioned to you, jumping from here to there. So this was the first application that we did uh, where I had a couple of students work on it and they did a really good job because we were working on many real projects. So we had real data from the design, both from the code-based design, also from the performance-based design. So we then we collected about 100 buildings or 80 or 90 at that time. We decided to use that data to see if we could use it to generate AI tool for that. So basically, we use the data from the detailed and design buildings, we train the system, and then we use a new building, and then we were able to do cost estimation, roughly preliminary sizing, preliminary design, and most importantly, check on the design, because then you can say what was the previous design that was verified, so that can be used as a check. So this is the overall concept. And we had several buildings, many of them actually from Philippines, uh, most of them in fact, and then we had the architectural plans and we extract the, the data and then organize it. And then we, we do, do the design, performance-based design, code-based cost, code design, get the data and then link everything together through several layers of artificial neural networks. We were able to identify 14, 15 parameters that you could define the building. For example, the number of bays and, and so on and so forth. And based on those numbers, the program would give, a, give you what would be the expected reinforcement in core wall, for example, what would be the natural period, what would be the thickness of shear wall, and so on. So we could predict many of the design based on the data for a similar type of building. Of course, the, this was limited because the buildings we had were ranged between 30 to 50, 50 story. So you couldn't use it outside. But if you have enough data, then we can expand the range. We presented this work several places, including in, in CTPUH. And it was quite interesting because we were able to at least show in concept that the system can work to give reasonable results. Second attempt, two theses were actually done and actually we presented in several places. Second now attempt recently is using the data to compute building efficiency directly. Because if you want to design efficient buildings, it's an iterative process. You start with the preliminary design, you do the detailed design. If you don't like it, you go back and then you can end up with different designs, this or that. And we don't know which one is efficient because we just follow the design. But if we have a lot of data, we could define efficiency and we could go to the efficient solution directly. And that's what we try to do through this thesis, uh, which was actually quite well done by a student recently. So we, we developed an efficiency framework which you can use to define the efficiency of a building and then measure the building efficiency, system efficiency, and then see whether this building is going to be efficient or not structurally. And also even sustainability and other parameters can be added because the framework is general. You can, you can add many parameters to it. This is the outcome from that. So using the data, so we could actually generate the efficiency, parameter the matrices, and then evaluate the system on that efficiency and predict what the system would be. And we did that, we applied that to a simple column first, uh, you know, designing an efficient column side, column section, and then expanded to a frame and then to a full building. And so this is the doorway to data-driven structural design, basically. But if we have enough data from previous design, or even we can generate data, then we can use that data to come to the final design right away. Another one is the, the learning from the calibration of the structural models. Once again, this is a thesis. So we have now access to several building data sensors. So we could bring that data back and calibrate the models, not only calibrate individual models, but determine factors that could help us to calibrate models that, we, that are not the same that are built. So once again, data and AI could be used to help calibrate the models because the natural frequency is a one indicator that we can backtrack. Back and if we have good data on that, 
we can map that and then we can fix the, the data that we have, the, the models that we have. Another work is on uh, crack inspection and monitoring, monitoring of tall buildings, defect monitoring. So, or de defect determination through AI, through vision. So if you take a picture of a building facade, for example, or of a beam uh, or a column, uh, either by cell phone or by a drone, uh, then you could use that picture to determine whether there is a defect in that structural member or not. What kind of defect is that? Is that defect dangerous or not? So basically we looked at the cracking in beams and columns and walls, and then based on the direction of the crack, the location of the crack, the length of the crack, the size of the crack, all determined from images, you can then say, oh, whether this, how severe is this cracking? Number of cracks, spacing of cracks. So you can correlate all of that to the severity of the, the damage. And then this is purely based on taking a picture and running it through the system to see whether we need to do more investigation or not, whether this crack is just this is purely uh, non-structural or is it structural? And if it is structural, how significant it is. This is another work of the organ based on AI and data and, and vision. And similarly, another this is done by one of these engineers from Philippines on using the design and analysis output data to determine the performance of the non-structural components. And uh, this is not purely based on AI, but it's still based on the data that is generated from other sources and then use that data to generate other outputs. And every building has this data and we could use that combined with the architectural input and generate more information. Another one was an interesting thesis on generating fragility curves artificially. Normally when we work, uh, we generate the fragility curves through testing and through other simulations, but we could generate fragility curves by artificially generating the data also. For example, in this case, we try to do that for a bridge, a column uh, subjected to earthquake, and then using several uh, seismic curve inputs uh, with using the incremental dynamic analysis and, and uh, uh, lots of data generated, we were able to generate the fragility curves without actually having to test them because you can use detailed nonlinear modeling and, and the analysis for these cases once, and you can use this data to apply to bridges in the future for which that nonlinear analysis may not be practical as long as the bridge class is the same, the classification is the same. So this was another interesting application of the AI. Another one is the using the, the, the sensors uh, and the input from the buildings, measured buildings, bring it back, calibrate the models, and not just calibrate those models, but use that as a learning to find out what is typically deficient in models, why the models do not match the reality. What parameters are the ones which are not right? Is it the modulus of plasticity, which is not right? Is it the cracking factors, which are not right? Is it the estimation of the density, which is not right? Is it the thicknesses which we didn't input correctly? Which parameters affect the stiffness and the mass of the structure in a model that does not match with reality? So we can use not only these, these sensor data for specific project, but also use that knowledge to identify what are the parameters that we should be looking at and then improve those or concentrate on those parameters. So now what is the way forward now that we have have this exposure to all these technologies and we have learned that we are not really doing significant yet. Way forward is quite simple. First, we have to realize or we have to identify or we have to recognize that data is the king. Absolutely, you know very well. All these social media companies, they work on the data that we generate for them free. Google and every company. If we have data and we have data, structural engineers have data, we should extract it, organize it, and make it available for ourselves or for others who are doing the search for developing these tools. And then keep an eye on the technological developments around us, not only in our field, but also in other disciplines. Medicine, I'm always amazed at how much medicine uses technology. 
if you go to hospital, I hope you don't have to. Every time there is a new device, there's a new machine, there's a new way of measuring, you know, new testing, new visualization that they have developed, all based on AI, all based on technologies, imaging and all. And medicine is medical industry or medicine is one area. And so is other automobiles, another one. Every time a new version of the car comes in, there's so much tech in there that it feels like that you're you know, using an, your cell phone rather than a car. Then we have to learn to apply these new, new technologies. For example, AI, data analytics, and machine learning. First of all, understand them a little bit. What are they? But most importantly, what can they do? Because they all are looking for a problem to solve. By themselves, they cannot do anything. They only are as good as the problem they solve. So if you find a good problem for them to solve, then it would be an interesting solution. And then explore opportunities for utilizing data and experience to make process and output better and faster. Then create new processes that we didn't do before. A lot of new, I would say, businesses can be generated, can be based on this, these tools. See, things that we just don't do as structural engineers, we could be doing if we, have, if we develop these tools for ourselves and link them with our traditional tools. And then we can create new products, new markets, new services that we, we don't even think of. We can start offering them to the clients, not just to traditional, you know, they should not see us only the people who calculate the number of bars in the column. They should see us people who can come up with something really interesting, very quickly off the cuff with very minimal data. And then we can show them also in a, a you know a visual and insightful manner. So basically, we need to develop skills to understand, to establish relationships between things, to simulate and visualize, to create configuration, proportion systems, and to communicate whatever we are doing effectively within ourselves and also to our clients and our partners and our other stakeholders that we work with. With these skills, with these technologies, I'm sure that all of us can easily bring our profession as at par with many other professions that are relying so much on technologies. So we have got to switch on this innovation switch at all the time, and then explicitly consider this in everything that we do. I know we are, most of us are so busy in day-to-day -day work that we don't have enough time sometimes to do that. And big organizations, many organizations have these startup companies or startup teams within their organization, whose job is to find ways to do things. So if you're a structure engineering company or structure engineer, have one, one person, one hour, or one team working on just blue sky thinking, finding new things to do, bringing technologies in. And so lifelong learning and continued academic and professional development, research and knowledge sharing like this one is all that we need. So I, I do hope that uh, you know, with the collective knowledge that we have, the data that we have, the information that we have, we, we, if we keep hiding, holding it onto ourselves alone, then the profession as a whole will have difficult time uh, competing with others. And we, you know, we don't know, somebody might just take all the data that we have and simply disrupt the instruction hearing and come up with a tool. It has happened to many industries already. So I hope that we do that before anyone else does that. So with that, I thank you all.